Welcome everyone to Fantasy Foresight, the podcast. We're your hosts and co-founders of FantasyForesight.com, coming to you from the Rambo Fixture Company Studios. I'm Ben. And I'm Jay. You ready to get rolling, Jay? You know it. Let's do this. All right, let's go. Welcome in, everyone. It is Saturday, July 13th, and we are back for the Saturday morning coffee deeper voice edition of Fantasy (laughs) Foresight, the podcast. But hey, we've got the whole gang here. We're up and at them. Really excited to come and talk some fantasy football with you this morning. And we've got the exciting wide receivers and tight ends of the AFC West. A bunch of big playmakers out there, and I'm really excited to get into it. How are you this morning, Jay? Hey, same way, man. This is an exciting group of players in fantasy land and I cannot wait to dive in so Steve how are you doing hey I got my coffee right here I'm ready to go and we got a lot of fantasy relevant players to talk about so uh, yeah I'm pumped to get into it guys all right let's dive in absolutely first up we've got Kansas City Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey obviously the tight end one overall in your drafts currently going at the 203 spot according to fantasyfootballcalculator.com with 12 team PPR redraft settings and he's going in front of Zach Ertz, George Kittle and OJ Howard. Foresight projection and the total foresight rank at fantasyforesight.com are in complete alignment. We have him as the overall tight end one and his savage rating is second of 32 amongst all teams in the NFL as far as strength of schedule goes and his career finishes over the last several years tight end one, tight end one, tight end one, tight end eight, tight end six. The man is a rock solid tight tight end one and if you just look at him last season played all 16 games 150 targets 103 receptions 1336 yards 13 yards per reception 10 touchdowns I mean he's really at that wide receiver level and not just that tight end level yeah it's pretty ridiculous even his next gen stats are off the charts as far as his team percentage of targeted air yards he was wide receiver running back and tight end 31 overall he was wide receiver running back and tight end 25 in yards after completion per reception so he is an elite pass catcher period steve i'd have to imagine he was elite as far as consistency goes as well yeah jay he certainly was i mean he's tight end one in pretty much every metric right up there with zach Ertz. as far as falling in the top six every week top 12 every week and then when you look at his average weekly ranking he came in only behind zach Ertz. and i do want to point out that at at least for me, when it comes to projecting Travis Kelsey heading into the 2019 season, I am a little weary about the Tyreek Hill suspension. Because for me, anyways, I look back to 2016 and Travis Kelsey weeks one through seven in 2016, he was actually tight end 13. And I do want to remind you, 2016 was the season that Kelsey broke out and finished as tight end one. And he's been there ever since. And once you started seeing Tyreek Hill get significant snaps, I'm talking 60% or higher in 2016, that's when Travis Kelsey became the tight end one in all of fantasy football. And he's been there ever since. So I do think that there is the potential for there to be a pretty big impact on Travis Kelsey when it comes to his fantasy production if we don't have Tyreek Hill on the field. And this is really the conversation that needs to be had about Kelsey, and and it is a big one because there is some volatility there with the defenses he'll face if Hill's not on the field. Now, I've been going over this a lot in my mind, and what I envision personally is that his volume is very safe regardless. If Hill's not on the field, He's going to be the reliable pass catcher on that offense for a young quarterback. So his targeted air yards may dip. He may be running more shallow routes, but I think at least in PPR land, his volume is safe and those targets are going to increase while Hill is gone. And again, we don't know what's going to happen with Hill. You know, you've seen suspensions for eight games around what his situation is. So when it comes to the end of the fantasy season, that could free up Kelsey to get back to his old ways and maybe get some deeper routes back in and return to form. But in the meantime, 
meantime, I think he can still be a very high-end productive tight end just based on the volume that he'll see. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. His volume safe, you know, his upside could be hampered in the absence of Tyreek Hill a little bit. But if he will eventually return to the team down the stretch, you make an outstanding point that that could in turn result in an influx at the tight end position on your fantasy team as you're heading down the stretch. So, I, I mean, that that high equity is the only thing that gives me pause. The top end of the second round, I, I mean, I'll be honest, in all of my mock drafts, you know, I do a lot of different experiments. I like my rosters overall a lot better if I'm going wide receiver running back and taking tight end and quarterback late. But I'm certainly not going to argue with you if you think that Travis Kelsey and that positional advantage is worth that high end equity. Because like I said, Every year for the last five years, he's been a tight end one. And for the last three, he's been the tight end one. So I get it. And we talked about it before this podcast. Right now, Travis Kelsey's total foresight ranking would make him WR7 overall, right where AB is currently being ranked in our metrics. And that takes into account actual fantasy production, projected fantasy production, strength of schedule, and efficiency metrics. And to have a WR1 essentially in your tight end position is of great value. Now, Total Foresight doesn't know the Tyreek Hill issue is looming, but right now it is factored into his projections. So should something break, that will adjust. But as of right now, you can plug in Travis Kelsey at an appropriate value as a WR1 in your tight end spot on your team. You're right, but I think that as news breaks about Tyreek Hill, as we've previously discussed, the masses are going to automatically just chalk that up as a positive for Travis Kelsey. And I think we on this podcast are in the minority by saying not so fast. That might hamper his upside a little bit, even though that might be offset by his volume potentially. So all we're saying is that understand that the upside is getting that wide receiver one type as a positional advantage at your tight end position. And the downside is you could spend that high end draft equity and Travis Kelsey could dip down to that tight end three ish range this season. And you could feel like you wasted a little bit of a draft pick there. So that's the long and short of it. Nobody's going to blame you if you go with Travis Kelsey at any point in your draft. Moving on, next up at the tight end position, the only other fantasy-relevant tight end in the AFC West is LA Chargers tight end Hunter Henry coming back off of that ACL in the preseason in 2018. And the foresight projection has him as tight end 8, and total foresight bakes that risk in and has him as tight end 18. He's currently going as tight end 5 at the top of the 6th round behind George Kittle and OJ Howard and in front of Evan Ingram and Eric Ebron. Yeah, you know, look, he's got career finishes of tight end 19, tight end 14, and then a season-ending injury season. Now, his Savage ranking this year is ninth best in the NFL, so I do like seeing that, but we have not seen him put together an elite tight end one overall performance for the duration of an entire season in his career. So for him to be going tight end five, there's a lot of hope and a lot of expectation there, But it's a prove-it season for me for Hunter Henry. Yeah, and to be fair, there was always Antonio Gates looming at the tight end position as well. And now he is theoretically retired. There are some talks that maybe he's not. But, you know, I think they've made it very clear that they want Hunter Henry to be the guy at the tight end position. And there is certainly some upside. There's no Tyrell Williams in that offense. Melvin Gordon could be holding out. So they may be desperate for some pass catchers in that offense. So he He could see some additional targets, but, you know, for me, Hunter Henry is an attractive name. I I know he's kind of a sexy pick uh, in the industry right now, but, you know, in the sixth round at tight end five, there's still a little bit of risk there for me, knowing what he's going to be coming back from injury and whether or not he can actually string together an elite level tight end performance, like I said, for the duration of an entire fantasy football season. And Jay, you just said it best, where he is going right now in drafts, and we've talked about the volatility of tight ends over the past half decade and how hard it is to hit on guys that aren't in that top two, three conversation. It's extremely difficult. And when you look at Hunter Henry's past record here, we're talking tight end 19, tight end 14, missed the season with an ACL, 
for me personally, like I get it. We're all thirsty in the fantasy industry to have those, you know, the breakout tight end because well said. We need it right now, but I don't know, guys. I, Mike Williams is there. He has already shown us with ten touchdowns last season. He is a monster red zone threat for the Chargers, and I don't know. For me, I just don't see it. You you said it very well, Steve. Hunter Henry to me is the New Orleans tight end position over the past five seasons, where you're just so thirsty for that position to be what you think it's supposed to be and it just never materializes yeah and quite frankly everybody wants antonio gates of old back (laughs) (laughs) you know yeah take me back to 2004 (laughs) right so that wraps up the tight ends in this division moving on to a a plethora of talent at the wide receiver position in the afc west starting off with new addition to the AFC West this offseason, Oakland Raiders wide receiver Antonio Brown. His foresight projection is currently wide receiver six, whereas total foresight has him ranked as wide receiver three. Now, here's the good part. In drafts, he's currently going as wide receiver seven at the 206 spot behind Odell Beckham Jr., Juju Smith, and in front of Mike Evans and Keenan Allen. And we talked about this guy when we covered Steve's ADP study for the wide receiver position over the last half decade. And just take a look at it. Last several seasons, wide receiver five, wide receiver one, wide receiver one, wide receiver one, wide receiver one, wide receiver three. (laughs) You know, I mean, this guy is an absolute PPR monster. Now, here is another one of those crazy scenarios where fantasy pros strength the schedule has the wide receivers for Oakland as one of the worst in the league, whereas Savage taking into account the quality of the fantasy points allowed as well as the quantity of the fantasy points allowed has the pass catchers for the Oakland Raiders with the best outlook as far as strength of schedule goes in 2019. Yeah, I mean, you said it. He has been the gold standard at the wide receiver position over the last several years. He played in 15 games last season. He was... Look, top end in pretty much every metric across the board, Ben. WR5 overall, WR2 in points per game, WR3 in targets, WR7 in receptions. I want to get to efficiency. He was WR12 in yards per reception, WR1 in touchdowns. Yeah, I'll take that. And then last season in Pittsburgh, he was wide receiver, running back, and tight end five in team percentage of targeted air yards. That's pretty surprising. You know, we are all talking about the hype around Juju, and to be WR tight end five is is pretty surprising in percentage of targeted air yards for his team. I think we all saw at the end of that season how volatile and tumultuous it was clearly in that locker room. And don't think for one second that. That doesn't impact your preparation and your on-field performance. So, you know, I just think with a fresh start in a place that is completely welcoming AB and showing him all the love, all of these workouts with his strobe light glasses on one leg, <laughs> on the balancing ball, all Derek Carr looking jacked in some of these highlights I'm seeing where he's throwing the ball deep to AB and AB's looking like his old self. So it's all there for him and people are just completely writing him and Derek Carr off and it's crazy. But I doubt digress steve before we completely go off the deep end and just showing all the love to ab just remind us how consistent he was in 2018 yeah guys when you talk about a consistent wide receiver there's really probably outside of deandre hopkins and Devontae adams none better so you look at antonio brown top six performances in that upper echelon tied for wr8 when you look at times he placed in the top 12 so a wr1 or better tied for wr2 And here is what really blows my hair back, and I'm bald. (laughs) But uh, so weeks in the top 24. So a WR2 locked and loaded or better. Antonio Brown finished there 14 times. Guys, that's 14 out of 15 weeks. He was a WR2 or better. And that finished him. He was the best in the entire fantasy football season last year in that metric. And then his overall average weekly rank finishes wr3 so and you guys spoke to it a little bit we talked about it when it came to his repeat performances over the last half decade it's like a b 
He's always there in that top one, two, three spot in fantasy football. And like you guys spoke to, I don't get why he's being dismissed just because he went to Oakland and he's going to be playing with Derek Carr. As far as I'm concerned, if he's healthy, he will see 160 plus targets and he will turn that into massive production like he always does because he's the best we've seen in our generation. WR7, he's an absolute steal, guys. I can't believe that that's where he's currently going in drafts blows my mind to further your point here's one point i want to make about antonio brown last season with juju smith schuster in the same offense he had 168 targets in 15 games i think everybody assumes he's going to be the target monster in oakland people are just worried about the accuracy of Derek carr well last year in pittsburgh with big ben he had 168 targets like i said and only had 104 catches so i'm not sure how many more missed opportunities people think he's going to have with Derek Carr, but I don't see any reason why that same percentage can't be maintained in Oakland. You're right. And we just talked about in our last episode why you shouldn't sleep on Derek Carr and how he was a QB 11 in fantasy football just a few short seasons ago when Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree were playing the best football of their careers. And so I'm sorry, neither of those guys are Antonio Brown. This is a massive upgrade for Derek Carr, and I think he has just as good of a weapon that he's ever had before, and Tyrell Williams outside. So I think that it's going to be just another business-as-usual monster wide receiver one, two, three type of year for A.B., and for some reason, a lot of people are going to be surprised by that, apparently. All right, let's move on to the next drafted wide receiver in this talent to division and that is one Keenan Allen who is currently being drafted as the ninth wide receiver late in the second round behind guys like Antonio Brown and Mike Evans but ahead of fellow studs Adam Thielen and T.Y. Hilton his aggregate projection at Fantasy Foresight has him listed as WR9 right where he is being drafted his total foresight rank is WR8 just a little bit ahead and so far Keenan Allen in his career has put up WR19 numbers, WR37, WR41, but then we saw him turn it on, finishing as WR3 and then WR12 in his most recent two seasons. Last year, he played all 16 games. Love seeing that for a guy who had some injury issues. He was WR12 overall, WR12 in targets, WR9 in receptions, Ben. Pretty good season. Yeah, and I mean, he was a deep play guy as well. He was wide receiver, running back, tight end, 18 overall in the NFL and next-gen stats, team percentages of targeted air yards. And, you know, he missed most of week 15. Uh, it was a Thursday night game. He went out early in the first quarter, but he came back the next week. So like we said, he technically played all 16 weeks. And he's a guy that is, I believe now, now proven himself to be durable enough to be counted on on that back end wide receiver one type of guy and I think that is also supported by some of the consistency metrics that he put up last season certainly Ben you're right there with that so it's funny because in my notes that I had for this podcast when it came to Keenan Allen you know I have right here written he's certainly solid when you look at him in the top 12 tied for WR8 you look at him as a top 24 wide receiver wr2 or better on a weekly basis wr11 so there's that consistency where you're in that wr12 range and you mentioned it when it came to the fantasy playoffs there was definitely a drop off finished wr12 he had that game where he came in tweaked his knee had no receptions no anything and you know pretty much really hurt people and in the semifinal round of the fantasy playoffs and then your championship round he was wr46 but as far as how i feel about him heading into next year the same as you guys kind of like touched on a little bit there's there's always going to be with someone like keenan allen a little you know a little bit of an injury concern just based on his entire nfl background and the injury we've seen him have but he certainly is somebody who I, I feel very confident as having as a WR2 on my team. I really just don't feel as confident having him as a WR1, especially given the fact that I do think there will be an emergence from Mike Williams in the LA Chargers offense this season. I think he's going to get more targets and, you know, 
Keenan Allen doesn't really have that much of a touchdown upside. Yeah, Steve, I agree with you. I think I shy away from his current price tag of wide receiver nine at the back end of the second round a little bit. In my mock drafts personally this offseason, I'm getting him a little bit later as my wide receiver too, like you said, as the preferred role on our fantasy roster. But beyond that, I think we've got him accurately pegged. And his ceiling is that middle of the road wide receiver one. And his floor, I think, is more of that middle of the road back end wide receiver two, depending on how much of a step Mike Williams takes, who we will cover him in just a second. But the next wide receiver being drafted in this division is a very controversial one. Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver Tyreek Hill. So before we get started on this guy, obviously there's some heinous off the field things that are going on with him. Uh, we, we're going to keep our focus just to the fantasy football realm, but obviously kids come first and whatever this guy did. It's bad, but you know, for a guy who was coming into his career and being doubted as being able to actually be an elite wide receiver and then to come out and show that he can be he by finishing WR3 overall, WR9 then WR3 overall, to have these off the field issues is it's frustrating because you just want people to do the right thing and to take advantage of their opportunities. And he's just somebody who can't seem to keep his nose clean for whatever reason. And, it, and it's sad. But like you said, from a fantasy football perspective, right now, Tyreek Hill is going as WR16 in drafts in the fourth round behind Stefan Diggs and Julian Edelman in front of guys like Brandon Cooks and Kenny G still, even with all this risk baked in of a possible large suspension looming. In total foresight, we have him ranked as WR9 currently, and that's partially due to his actual pass production and his incredible efficiency. But don't forget, his projections are baked in there as well. And right now, we just don't know what to expect. He has the second best Savage ranking in the NFL for the wide receiver position. And like I said, in his first three seasons, he finished as WR25, WR9, then WR3. So the arrow was pointing up for Mr. Tyreek Hill. Yeah, listen, he's an elite big play guy. He was wide receiver two, minimum 50 receptions, was 17 yards per reception in 2018. He had almost 1,500 receiving yards, which was good for wide receiver four. 137 targets, just 87 conversions off of those targets. Uh, was wide receiver 10 in receptions for that category. Was wide receiver three with 12 touchdowns and his next gen stats he was a targeted air yard monster wide receiver running back tight end 11 uh, as far as just targeted air yards and then team percentage of targeted air yards he was wide receiver running back tight end three and he was a wide receiver running back tight end 15 and yak yards per reception so the guy's a beast when he plays you know I personally am going to be shocked based on just what Kareem Hunt got yeah I'm gonna be shocked if the guy doesn't get double digit games so I really just don't think that he's going to be somebody in a month that anybody's going to be really talking about that much you can look at Kareem Hunt you can look at Adrian Peterson too in his case they're a little bit different I admit but Adrian Peterson ended up missing the entire season during his issue so yeah big question marks surrounding Tyreek Hill heading into 2019 I totally agree with you guys I can't see a world where he's not suspended at least yeah. you know 10 plus games but yeah we'll um, pick him up mid-season on our preview review episodes you can just hear it in all of our voices we're just like man. he's gonna be suspended man like let's just not go. yeah elite talent but we don't even really want to talk about him right now just because of what's going on so it's yeah like, you know i uh, i know steve is really looking forward to discussing our next guy so we'll just go ahead and move like, on right. yeah we'll go ahead and move on to la chargers mike williams and we will give steve plenty of time to go through nice. the consistency and his thoughts on this guy but currently he is going as wide receiver 25 in drafts at the back end of the fifth round at the 5'11 spot behind Tyler Lockett, Jarvis Landry, and in front of DJ Moore and Tyler Boyd. Quite a group. Yeah, no kidding. The foresight projection has him as wide receiver 27. Now, total foresight has his limited sample size baked into a wide receiver 40 ranking. And when you look at his overall performance last year, it's insane to think about that with just 66 targets, he was able to convert that into a wide 
wide receiver 32 overall performance. That's an excellent point, but I do love the fact that he played in all 16 games. His career finishes so far entering his third season. He finished as WR 138 his rookie year. Improved that to WR 32 in his sophomore season, like you said. With the sixth best Savage ranking, I mean, the arrow could be pointing up for Mike Williams. Tyrell Williams is no longer there. Hunter Henry is back. Uh, we don't know about the Melvin Gordon situation, as we've discussed. So, you know, he was WR10 in yards per reception with 15.4 yards per reception. He was tied for WR5 with 10 touchdowns, which we saw his scoring late in the season. So, again, an arrow pointing up for a guy, possibly. His next-gen stats, he was wide receiver, running back, and tight end 10 in average targeted air yards, a deep threat. I mean, that's impressive, WRT 10. And as far as percentage of team targeted air yards, he was actually wide receiver, running back, and tight end 33, which surprises me. I don't know about you guys. I mean, he was a deep play monster. You look at his yards per reception at 15.4. You look at his next gen stats, average targeted air yards, and that just pops off the page at you. This is his third year in the NFL. He is a young, healthy wide receiver. And I was going to say, and actually looking at his consistency numbers, Steve, it's right in line with where he's being drafted yeah absolutely i mean all right so guys he only had 66 targets last year so as far as being a consistent wide receiver that really wasn't in the cards for him last year but you do have tyrell williams leaving and hunter henry is coming back so you know there probably will be a little bit of a tug of war with those red zone targets between hunter henry and mike williams but there is so much being said last season and this year about mike williams he's pretty much like a defensive end playing wide receiver he was completely healthy last year the skill sets there there's targets being opened up it's going to be very interesting where he's going in drafts right now there's usually not the potential for somebody who could actually finish as a wr1 that is completely in the realm of possibility when you think of mike williams getting 100 plus targets in his red zone presence at the point he's going in drafts right now so he's a very interesting prospect when it comes to a redraft this year and yeah i'm really looking forward to seeing what happens with mike williams in this la chargers offense and how much he actually will get targeted by philip rivers and if you were somebody who was lucky enough to start mike williams in the fantasy playoffs last year you were rewarded in week 15 with a wr2 overall performance so he had he has shown his elite upside in weeks that it really matters on the fantasy calendar now the only question is heading into 2019 can he string together performances over the duration of a season and make himself truly fantasy football not only relevant but relevant in an elite way. When you look at the guys going around him in the draft, I'd say it really depends on what you need at that point. If you're really needing somebody that's going to give you a little bit more stability, maybe you go in a different direction. If you need somebody that's going to present a lot of that higher upside, maybe you go more in the Mike Williams direction. And you said it, the guys going around him are guys that I like quite a bit. So You've got Lockett, Landry, DJ Moore, and and Tyler Boyd all just really solid fantasy plays this season. So he's going in a very good group, which shows you what people are currently thinking about him. Yep, you're absolutely right. All right, moving on to the next wide receiver in this talented deep division is, wait, no, this, this can't be right. Sammy Watkins is the next drafted player in this division going as WR28 in the sixth round. People, this is your friend Jay here. Stop. Just (laughs) stop with the Sammy Watkins thing. Ben, you have the floor. Please shed some light on Sammy Watkins. I'm just going to say, if you are a Sammy Watkins believer, please just hit me up on Twitter at Foresight Ben. I've got an investment opportunity for you. (laughs) So anyways, I do not understand why this guy is being drafted as wide receiver 28, okay? Let's just take a look at his fantasy points per game 
over his five year career sample size. I think that's fair because we all know that over the last five seasons, he has missed 18 games. So I'm not even going to hold that against him, which is a very tangible negative on your fantasy football team. We're just going to look at it through the lens of fantasy points per game compared to his ADP price tag of wide receiver 28 points per game in 2014 finishes wide receiver 32 in 16 games 2015 he was actually tied for wide receiver 13 in 13 games in 2016 he was wide receiver 53 in points per game in just eight games in 2017 he was wide receiver 49 in points per game in 15 games and last year he was tied for wide receiver 38 in points per game in just 10 games so why people think he is now going to be wide receiver 28 or better is beyond me. It is a matter of time before the guy misses some time with injury. And from a points per game perspective, he doesn't even do it for you. So I just don't get it. No, that's enough said. Any any truthers out there, that is the argument against Sammy Watkins. And I believe the case is closed. Yeah, guys, it's interesting because people saw Sammy Watkins flash a little bit last year in Kansas City's offense. You know, the games he actually did participate in. And you know what? He had Tyreek Hill playing opposite of him. So just keep that in mind for the people that want to reach and take Sammy being like, oh, well, Tyreek Hill's not there. He's the number one. Well, we'll see how well that uh, Sammy Watkins fares when he is the guy in the Kansas City offense. And again, he was WR 38 last season in points per game with Tyreek Hill taking some of the heat off him in defensive coverage. So yeah, let's see if he can improve upon WR 38 numbers when he's the lone healthy wide receiver. And one more thing, the Kansas City Chiefs, we we all expect to be a high quality football team. So they're not going to be somebody that's going to force feed Sammy Watkins if that's not going well either. Right. Right. All right, let's move on to another wide receiver core that has a lot of interesting pieces in it. And the next one up is Cortland Sutton, currently being drafted as WR44 late in the ninth round, going behind Marquez Valdez Scantling, DK Metcalf in front of guys like Golden Tate and Kiki Kuti. I always have to say it that way. His <laughs> foresight projection, his aggregate projection, has him ranked as WR49, so right in line with where he's being drafted, and his total foresight rank is WR59, so a little bit behind, and that's just due to his limited sample size of what we've seen so far, because of what we saw from him last year, he finished WR50, even though he did play in all 16 games. He was tied for WR60 in points per game, and he was WR44 in targets, WR56 in receptions, and WR41 in yards. Now, he was WR7 in yards per reception with a minimum of 40 catches with 15.9 yards per catch. So that is an attractive stat, but he did get some more opportunities after, after Demarius Thomas was traded, but still we're looking at where he's going in drafts seems to be appropriate for what we've seen so far in his career, even though we think he's going to get more opportunities to take a step forward in his sophomore campaign of 2019. Yeah, we've got a new coaching staff coming in. you got a new quarterback coming in who's going to stabilize that off a little bit so I don't even know how much his uh, qualitative next gen stats matter this season but it is worth noting that he was wide receiver running back tight end 13 in average targeted air yards and he was wide receiver running back tight end 24 in team percentage of average targeted air yards so he is clearly a deep threat guy it will be interesting to see what happens with some more targets he only had 84 last season but he's also going to have improved corners now covering him and it's, it's just we'll see hey, Steve and I do have to say I liked the trend of his playoff performances during weeks 14 through 16 yeah I mean you did see him go from WR 82 to WR 38 to WR 14 as far as his uh, fancy playoff performances are concerned and Ben you just mentioned it and I think you uh, hit the nail on the head as far as Cortland Sutton, he certainly seemed to struggle once he took over that WR1 role on the Broncos last season. And I, I don't know. I don't know, guys. For me, he's with Joe Flacco at quarterback in the Denver offense. For me, he's pretty much undraftable. And the reason I say he's undraftable is I don't want to start him any given week. And I don't think he's a good bench stash either. Just based on you guys know in our league of record last year, I went out and put up quite a bit so I could uh, acquire Cortland Sutton once he was taking over that WR1 role. 
and it absolutely backfired. He was a worse player when he was thrusted into that role where he was going to see the top coverage from opposing defenses every week. That's supported by uh, something that was posted on DenverBroncos.com just a couple days ago. Quote, Sanders' injury had a profound impact on Sutton's production, which waned without Sanders in the final four weeks of the year. With Sanders gone, Sutton saw number one cornerbacks and increased attention from opposing safeties. Without Sanders in weeks 14 through 17, he averaged 10.5 yards per reception and averaged 36 and a half yards per game well off his pace of the previous five games end quote yeah look it's just tough for rookies to step in and be a, a number one receiver in any offense we've seen that time and time again in the nfl and as we discussed off air the receivers in this offense are just tough to trust right now on a week-to-week basis. Ben, you mentioned it best. In best ball, these guys are a cheap alternative that could pay off for you, But even though there's still some risk there. But as far as season-long fantasy play, it's just tough to rely on any of these guys from a consistency basis. Yeah, DFS and best ball might give you some good value here and there, but beyond that, we're staying away until further notice. Next up, Miko Hardman in Kansas City. Hardman is currently being drafted WR48 late in the 10th round. We are getting into some cheap picks here. There's not a lot of cost. He's going behind guys like Kiki Kuti, Curtis Samuel, and in front of Dante Moncrief and Deshaun Jackson. Now, his foresight projection, his aggregate projection is WR68, a little bit behind where he's being drafted. His total foresight rank is much closer at WR53 So with a rookie with limited stats available, we have not seen what he can do at the NFL level yet. We don't know what his role is going to be in this offense quite yet because of what's going on in that wide receiver core. His savage ranking is attractive as being second best in the NFL, so the opportunity to succeed is certainly there. But again, we have some unknowns. And Ben, I think Dane Brugler his comments in his draft guide tell me a little bit about what to expect from the guy in his freshman campaign. You're absolutely right. In his draft guide, first off, it goes over his college stats at Georgia. Over the last two seasons, he's failed to convert a thousand yards receiving, and that's over the span of 27 games. And in the summary of Dane Brugler's draft guide, he's first off, he's wide receiver 13 in this draft class, according to his evaluations, and says, quote, Hardman is undersized and under refined, but he is a phenomenal athlete with the speed to develop into an impact slot receiver and return for any NFL team willing to be patient with his skill set, end quote. So there's potential there, but again, it's going to take some time to develop, and it's not like he's been some world beater at the SEC level. No, when he was drafted, I think everybody in the world saw him as a Tyreek Hill replacement. The only issue is he's undersized, and he's not quite the athlete, the elite athlete that Tyreek Hill was. And not to mention the fact that we've talked about how difficult it is for a rookie to step in and be able to be a leader in a wide receiving core at the NFL level. The odds are against him from stepping in and being a fantasy producer or at least a relevant fantasy producer and hearing some of these things certainly makes me hesitate in taking him on my roster. And yeah, guys. He's certainly not Tyreek Hill. If you recall, Tyreek Hill was a first round graded talent. Exactly. Who slid in drafts because of his off the field. We won't even get into that, but you know what I'm getting at. So, but that's what I mean. So, when it comes to Hardman, he's not going to step in and fulfill that role. He could over time. But if you recall, we were talking about Kelsey a little bit earlier. Like, even with Tyreek Hill, he had to be nurtured into the Kansas City offense over the course of his rookie season. And I just don't see, I mean, with Hardman, if you really like him and you want to target him, wait till somebody drafts him in the 10th round and then drops him after week three or four because he isn't doing anything. And then you go pick him up for free a little bit later on in the season. Just a tough person to trust. You kind of want to wait and see what it's going to look like. Steve summarized it perfectly. Moving on to the next wide receiver in this division, Denver Broncos wide receiver Manny Sanders. Now, I don't even think, unfortunately, it's worth going over all of the high quality statistics that Manny Sanders put up last season because it's all about the Achilles. Now, as recently as yesterday, there are new videos emerging on social media of him being a cyborg, you know, running just seven months after 
tearing his Achilles, running all these precision routes and things of that nature, which I love to see. We all are big Manny Sanders fans on this podcast, but the numbers guy in me sees a 32-year-old wide receiver coming off of an Achilles injury, and we just heard the unfortunate news about Darius Geis pulling a hamstring on his way back from nursing an injury, and I just feel like the first thing I think when I see Manny Sanders running like he's running, is that too much too soon? I think all it comes down to with Manny Sanders is price. He's going as WR52. In total foresight, we have him ranked as WR27, which is in line with his career stats. So it's a little bit behind because of his current projection. But WR52, 11th round, at that point in your draft, it's all about what you need. He's going around guys like Deshaun Jackson and James Washington and in front of Paris Campbell and Anthony Miller. Very different players. You have some home run hitters. You have some inconsistent players. You have Manny Sanders coming back from injury who could give you some upside. So it's all about where you want to go in your draft at that point. You've got one diamond in the rough right there, and his name is Paris Campbell. What are your thoughts on Manny Sanders, Steve? Well, that's what I was about to say is, like, like you were just speaking to Jay if you get to that point in time in your draft and you do need maybe maybe you're still reaching for that WR3 or you need somebody to flex or you just want a little bit of wide receiver depth if and it's a huge if at this point in time if Manny Sanders is slated to be a healthy Manny Sanders who's going to start in that Broncos offense I'm not opposed to picking him up and at least you know being one of those like burn and turn kind of a guys for the first couple of weeks of the season getting what you can out of him and seeing what happens but like you said at that price tag that's certainly fine, but not what you're paying for Manny Sanders of old, though. He could certainly give you a positive return on investment, but there are certainly some higher-end upside guys going around him as well. Yeah, and I just see people reaching on him and getting frustrated and dropping him early and going to be somebody else that you can pick up for free after, like, week two anyways. Yep. All right, so let's move on to Tyrell Williams, a guy that we've loved on this podcast. He is going WR55 behind Paris Campbell and Anthony Miller, but ahead of Devin Funches and Deshaun Hamilton. His total foresight rank has him ranked as WR49. In his career, he has career finishes of WR155 in his rookie campaign, but he bounced back and improved that to a WR18 overall finish, which put him on the fantasy map. He then followed that up with WR45 and WR48 finishes. So, what is he going to be now in Oakland? Coming off playing all 16 games... He was WR8 in yards per reception with 15.9 yards per catch with a minimum of 40 receptions. I mean, you said it all, Jay. Three out of his four career seasons in the NFL, he has finished overall at better than what his current price tag is. And we could all argue that he is in line for the biggest target share of his yep. career. Yep. And then when you look at his next-gen stats, they, they vet out that he is a deep threat. His average targeted air yards was wide receiver running back tight end 32 in the NFL last season. And he was wide receiver running back tight end 43 in the NFL last year and yak yards per reception. You know, he shows you a lot with having only 65 targets last year. He was WR 65 and yet he finished WR 48. He has shown you what he can do when he gets the ball in his hands. He just hasn't had that much of a target share opportunity yet. So I'm very interested to see what he can do in Oakland this year. And I think WR 55 is certainly a price point that he can certainly give you a positive return on investment. Yeah, no doubt. He's one, he's one of those guys is funny in my notes i just have best ball period best ball period best ball period <laughs> and, you know and that's kind of how i think of tyro williams and i think a lot of people probably would agree with that but it's very interesting to your point jay when it comes to this upcoming season in oakland he might get the largest amount of targets we've ever seen tyro williams get so i wouldn't be surprised if he's a guy that goes widely undrafted but then you know, three, four weeks into the season when people have seen like, wow, this guy's consistently getting targets and he's a deep threat receiver that he's a very high quality pickup off the waiver wire. He's currently going in the 12th round. Now, if he falls to the 14th round, he's a guy who I would love to take in the 14th round who has some great upside as opposed to an oft injured older tight end on a questionable Washington Redskins offense. This guy's going a round and a half <laughs> earlier for a reason. Here we and, go. and I would 
would take Tyrell Williams even earlier than that because I think Tyrell Williams is a big time sleeper this season. Per John Newby of 247sports.com on July 11th, quote, in his four year career, the Raiders' new receiver has scored on touchdowns longer than 75 yards four separate times. He's logged an 80 yard play as a rookie, added two more 75 yarders in 2017, and finished with a third 75 yarder in 2018. This is the best mark among active players since 2015. Williams tops Tyreek Hill, Amari Cooper, Odell Beckham Jr., Juju Smith-Schuster, and Deshaun Jackson, who are all tied for second place with three apiece, end quote. I mean, just think about what I just said there. Since 2015, he leads the NFL in 75-yard-plus plays. He's a big-time sleeper in the 12th round. Are you calling this breakout star for 2019? Absolutely. I mean, the guy's never flirted with, I mean, the one time that he got a big target share in Keenan Allen's absence, what'd he do? Wide receiver 18. Yep. At a wide receiver 55 price tag, that's pretty sweet. That's a pretty sweet return. You got it. All right, let's move on to the final wide receiver being drafted in this division, and that is Deshaun Hamilton. We've covered the other wide receivers being taken in this offense. Hamilton is currently being drafted as WR57 in the 13th round. Total Foresight has him ranked as WR85. Look, it's a limited sample size for Deshaun. He played in 14 games last year. He had 46 targets, which put him at WR88 level. You'd think he'd get some more opportunities this season, but the stats overall are just low end for wide receivers. So again, it's difficult to know what to expect on a consistency basis week to week in the 2019 season for this Broncos wide receiving core. Plain and simple, his relevance comes down to whether or not Manny Sanders is healthy and present in this offense. If he is not, then I think Deshaun Hamilton is going to be the lone consistent fantasy producer in Joe Flacco's offense. But if Manny Sanders is there, I mean, you're not going to be able to count on Deshaun Hamilton any more than anyone else. I'll tell you what, his fantasy playoff performance performances were pretty sweet too in Manny's absence with a wide receiver 14 finish a wide receiver 30 finish and a wide receiver 22 finish that is darn solid in the fantasy weeks in the fantasy world in Manny's absence but like you said it's all predicated on whether or not Manny is back yeah I couldn't agree with you guys more on that all right guys we did it another episode in the books well done I think we all learned a lot we got through it I hope everybody out there learned a lot about the wide receivers and tight ends from the AFC West All right, don't forget we have the Midwest Fantasy Football Expo in Canton, Ohio on August 18th. Come see us on Sunday from noon to 6. You won't want to miss it. We are saving one spot in the Fantasy Foresight Challenge to somebody who stops by our booth that day. And as a reminder of the Fantasy Foresight Challenge, it's your opportunity to take on six members of the Fantasy Foresight family in a season-long PPR league with the winner of the league taking home a $1,000 prize All you have to do to be considered for entry is make at least a $10 donation to the Special Olympics using the link on our Twitter page. Go check it out. Come try to take us on if you think you have what it takes. Ben, what are we looking at in our next episode? Coming up next, we have got the exciting quarterbacks and the running backs of the NFC West. Can't wait. And that wraps up this episode of Fantasy Foresight, the podcast. We thank you for joining us. Be sure to visit us, as always, at FantasyForesight.com. Use the links at the bottom of the page to find us across social media, including Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and wherever you pod. We hope you enjoyed the episode, and we'll see you next time.